So if you're joining us for the first time, that's great. Um, if you're not and you've been joining us for a while, that's also great. Uh, welcome this morning to our study on Christology. There's really no sweeter, warmer way to begin the Lord's Day than just plunging headlong into the doctrine of Jesus our Savior. And so let's do that together. Today is class number four in our Christology seminar. We've looked at thus far the divinity of Jesus Christ, or the deity, you could say, of Jesus Christ. We've looked at the humanity of Jesus Christ. We've looked at the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And today we will be looking at a unique subject called the states of Jesus Christ, the states of Christ. And if you know that theolog theological topic, then you'll know that there are two particular states that we will be looking at, which are the humiliation of Christ and the exaltation of Jesus Christ this morning. So we need the Lord's help. And so let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer this morning and then we can begin. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Christ, your son. Lord, what a blessing you've given to your people, this sweet and perfect revelation in your holy word of Christ, your beloved son. Lord, as we open up this truth from your word, we recognize that we need much of the Holy Spirit. We need much guidance in the word as we delve into one of the most beautiful realms of inspired word, God. And we just pray today that you might open our eyes all the wider to behold this beautiful son, this excellent one, the son of man, Emmanuel, so help us this morning as we look at Christ afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, again, just as I mentioned, this is class number four in our Christology class. We will be looking at the states of Christ. And uh, as I mentioned, those are known as the humiliation, firstly, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Now, this subject flows from our last class, particularly as we spent some time to look at the incarnation of the Lord Jesus. And one of those uh, main crux passages of that doctrine in Scripture is Philippians 2, verse 5 through 9. And we spent some time last week looking at that text. But I want to read that one more time at the outset of our study to remind us um, of this topic we'll be looking at today. And it says, Have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And I think this passage clearly begins to open up the realm that we'll be thinking about today with particularly in the first state of our study, which is humiliation. And the incarnation brings us to that reality just at the outset. Now, before we do move on, I think the states of Christ is often uh, mis are, are misunderstood in terms of what that actually means. And so I want to provide you a definition of what a state of Christ would actually be because I think sometimes there's the feeling that, um, that this might just be a feeling or an experience. It certainly is partially that, but it is more than that. And Louis Burkhoff, writer of uh, Systematic Theology, gives us this definition. I think it's pretty helpful. He says, a state is one's position or status in life, particularly the forensic relationship in which one stands to the law. Now that latter portion of the definition is important, but I think I want you to focus on the, the prior portion which says a state is one's position or status in life. Position particularly, Burkhoff describes as relating to a judicial part or a judicial aspect. And we know that when speaking of Jesus Christ, his state, his condition, had everything to do, his status, with his um, obedience to the law, his coming into this world to be the second Adam, his requirements, his task, his goal of the cross as an obedient God-man. 
So when we think of state, we're not just thinking of just feeling or subjective experience. I'm sure there is, like I said, an aspect of that, but mainly this is one's position, a status. And this is a status that Christ experienced. And these are the two that we could point out the most in terms of Christ's life and ongoing reality in heaven. So I want to start with chronologically, and that is really how this topic of study goes, chronologically through the life and ministry of Jesus from what is known as humiliation, step, 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 to exaltation, step, 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 step. And I think we've got about four in each category. So we're going to chronologically look at the life of Jesus in terms of his humiliation, and then we'll move into his exaltation this morning. So the first four stages, which are his humiliation, and remember, status, position of Christ, not necessarily feeling, are incarnation one, and we've spent time last week looking at that, suffering two, death three, and burial four. We'll look at those in stages together. So the first aspect, or I should say stage, of Christ's humiliation and uh, this is the one that we spent our whole class on last week, is the incarnation, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, which is, uh, like I mentioned last week, you could say his enfleshment, his taking upon himself human, humanness, uh, humanity to come and be in the presence of people, walk as a man in this world, but still God. Now, when I say incarnation as a stage of his humiliation, what I don't mean is that this was somehow outside of the desire of God. Remember, we can't look at humiliation in the sense maybe many of us understand humiliation. This was part of God's will. But when we think of the incarnation as the first stage of Christ's humiliation, we understand it as a a condescension, a lowering right? A voluntary leaving or veiling pre-incarnate glory to come and to walk on this earth as a man. And the text that we've been looking at over and over and over again, and we're going to just briefly look at it again today, is John 1 verse 14 for this subject. John 1 verse 14, and as I mentioned in the last class, I'm going to move pretty quick through some of these passages, so it'll be hard to keep up. You can just listen to me if you like. But it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So as the first stage in Christ's humiliation, this is Christ, Jesus, the eternal God, the eternally existent God, never created, entering into humanity, taking upon himself human flesh. Last week we talked about it in great detail. He was God in the beginning. He was with the Father forever. He created the world and he became in the likeness of sinful flesh. He took on himself the likeness of sinful flesh. And if we think about in terms of status or position, we could say there's really no greater humiliation than than this. There's no other measurement of condescension that we could possibly give. This is an incomprehensible Lowering. It would have been a lowering for an angel to do something like that. We know that's not necessarily possible, but in that sense of comparison, uh, an angel has a limit in terms of holiness. But Jesus Christ's holiness is not measurable. It exceeds any comprehension. Angels in heaven, seraphim and cherubim, you could say are unholy in comparison to the holiness of Jesus Christ and the glory of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus entered into humanity, his lowering was beyond measure. And so this is the first aspect of his state of humiliation. And this was necessary for salvation, as we've looked at in classes prior. He had to be the second Adam. He had to be like second Adam. He had to be obedient to the way that Adam was not. He had to be fully man, put under the law as a condition of his sacrifice. And he came in the most humblest way possible. This is part of that humiliation aspect. Just like last week, we talked about born of a virgin in in a stable, for that matter. And generally speaking, very unrecognized by the general public and certainly by Israel. In fact, the rulers wanted to kill him because to Herod, he he was a threat to his power. And I really like what uh, 14th century preacher Simon of Cassia stated on this subject of his humiliation, just speaking of it, he says, there is no room in the inn for the child miraculously born. The earth does not receive its God 
He has no suitable dwelling place in all the world. He whom heaven and earth cannot contain lies in a manger. That is such an incredible reality to think on. I know we'll never exhaust it. But a beautiful aspect to consider the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords, coming and lowering himself to this glorious position for us. So the first stage of Christ's humiliation, his incarnation. The second stage is his suffering, the actual suffering, the actual experience of Jesus while on this earth. And Isaiah 53, 3 probably states this more clearly than any other way when it says, speaking of this suffering servant, Jesus, that he was despised, he was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. We often think, when we think of the sufferings of Jesus Christ, that the only place that constituted that experience of Jesus would have been the end of his life, right? The, the cat of nine tails, the taking of the cross up to the hill on Golgotha, the nailing of himself to the tree. I didn't even mention the crown of thorns or the beating of various men. And then dying upon that cross under the weight of not only the guilt of his people, but the crushing wrath of the Father for all of his people's sin. Now that is certainly an aspect of his suffering and probably the chief, we could say, aspect. But what this text is telling us that Jesus' life was colored. It was characterized by suffering, grief, pain, agony. His whole life was a life of suffering in that sense. Now when I say that, I don't mean to imply that Jesus never had joy no, of course not. In fact, uh, Hebrews tells us he fixed his eyes upon the cross like flint, thinking of the joy that was before him. He was a joyous man in that reality. But the scriptures characterized by Jesus by means of his sorrow and grief. That's very interesting. And I think partially because of uh, many reasons to mention, but Christ lived in a sin-cursed world, right? As God, he experienced the infirmities of the fall in his own flesh. He knew what it was like to experience pain, uh, suffering, hurt, sorrow. The way of obedience for Christ would, would be a difficulty. Now, it wasn't just that he came to this world and in human flesh it was like, snap, obedience like that. He could certainly handle a lot more, obviously, immeasurably, immeasurably more than we could. But it wasn't that he agonized. It wasn't that he wasn't tempted. He certainly was. Christ experienced repeated assaults from Satan, he experienced the difficulties of temptation. He experienced the hatred and the unbelief of people he came to bring in, came to offer at least salvation to, those who would reject him and spit on him and even try to push him off cliffs and kill him right there. This was their Messiah. So Christ experienced the persecution, the rejection, the hatred of enemies even, and the awareness throughout his whole life of what was to come. Right, that at the end, he knew, he knew what it would be like. He knew in his head that there's a day coming when I will bear my father's scorn and wrath. And so when we think about Christ's suffering, these are part and parcel to these aspects of Christ's state of humiliation. Now, as we think of further in his suffering, Christ would have experienced the regular miseries, the infirmities of the fall like we would, but to an extreme level because of his, his capability to endure these sufferings as God. His capacity, you might say, for suffering was far more than ours. Far, far, far more than ours. And I like what Louis Burkhoff says in his systematic theology when he says, no one could feel the poignancy of pain and grief and moral evil as Jesus could. I mean, you think about the innocence of the King of Kings and what it would be to look upon evil right before his own eyes. Another note is to even forgive it when people come to him, just the majesty of Christ. But nonetheless, aspect, a part of his humiliation. He was God in flesh. But like I already said, yes, he did experience these pains, these sufferings, these sorrows, these grief throughout his life, but most of all, chief upon the cross. And his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane just gives us a piece, a parcel, just a little insight into what he was about to experience, pushed to the point of sweating drops of blood from his own pores, knowing that in but a few hours, you could say, 
God the Father would turn his gaze away from Jesus and damn him upon the cross as a guilty criminal taking the sins of his people. Such a reality when you think of the humiliation of the king. So that's the second stage in Christ's humiliation. Now continue to follow with me. We're on number three. The third chronological stage in Christ's humiliation, his, his status, his position of humiliation is his death, Christ's death, the actual experience of tasting what it is to die. <clears throat> and for this, I have Mark chapter 15, and verse 33 to 37 for us. And it says, and when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. We've, examining, we've examined this passage in previous classes where Christ gave up his spirit. Christ actually died. His suffering culminated in the fact that he wouldn't just experience pain, he would actually pass through that dark veil of death that was condemned to all men because of the fall. This was an infirmity that Jesus in his humiliation would experience in his flesh. The great result of the fall being death. And the Heidelberg Confession states this on subject, all the time he, speaking of Jesus, lived on earth, but especially at the end of his life, he bore in body and soul the wrath of God against the sin of the whole human race. And then by means of speaking at the end of his life, particularly his own death, body and soul, this is the rending of the two that Jesus would actually undergo. He would experience not only the sting of death, but the judicial pain of a particularly uh, condemned death by God the Father as he suffered the wrath of the Father for the sins of his people, like a criminal, like the worst of all criminals and under a torturous death, nonetheless. This would be a great manifold sting of death. And that is evidenced uh, mainly by Christ even quoting of Psalm 22, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Speaking of his aloneness on that cross. So this was, as I mentioned, the rending of soul from body in Christ. This was a, a death of a normal experience. A man, nonetheless, far, far more aggravated in Jesus, but there would be a separation there in particular. So that's the third stage of Christ's humiliation is Christ's death. Now the fourth one, fourth stage of Christ's humiliation, often isn't really um, thought of as a stage of Christ's humiliation, but it is nonetheless a stage which is the burial of Jesus Christ, the actual burial of Christ the Lord. And this is a unique one because uh, it's not necessarily an aspect of Christ's, you might say, active humiliation in terms of maybe his own personal felt experience, but it is nonetheless an aspect of, you could say, his passive humiliation. In Isaiah 53 verse nine, it says, speaking of this suffering servant Jesus, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So this text that's often quoted in the New Testament assumes that Christ's abode in death was a type of humiliation and that he was counted, right? Counted among those dead in the grave, counted among a dead man. And he was counted among particularly wicked men, those who died as a criminal of the law and a particular criminal of an egregious variety. 
And in terms of what people would see looking on in a tomb where Christ was buried, they'd see this man who died as a criminal and died as a man. And no doubt the unbelieving apostles see that reality or at least miss the true reality behind it, being grieved and sorrowed that that's the end of Jesus, that's the end of his ministry. It's all downhill from here. We know that that's not the case. But sticking on the point, uh, burial in itself is a type of biblical humiliation. And remember humiliation not in the terms of experience, but status or position. It is a type of humiliation that is a product of the curse. It tells us that we die because the wages of sin is death. We're put in the ground. And yes, pointing to a glorious, resurrected reality in the future. But nonetheless, we die because of sin. And so just looking at Genesis 3.19, it gives us that truth. It says, by the sweat of your face, this is the curse of God in the garden. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It is death is an unnatural thing. It is a product of the curse. And though Christ experienced it as a sinless man, not as a result of his own sin, but as a part of the infirmities and the consequences of the fall that he bore in himself as the second Adam, he still would undergo this aspect of humiliation. It's a picture of sin and its consequences when even we are put into the grave. So Jesus would be placed and counted among those who died under sin. Yet, we know the truth is, without ultimate corruption, without ultimate decay, as Psalm 1610 says, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption, speaking of Jesus. So that is the fourth stage of Christ's humiliation. And that's uh, just a general... um, um, navigation points that is commonly used throughout theological and systematic theology study. Those are those four. Now, we come to a point here which is very interesting. Uh, There's commonly in in the study of Christ's stages or the stages of Christ, you kind of have a bit of a diagram in terms of what he underwent. You start up here at the top of a V going down in humiliation from incarnation all the way to burial. But right at the bottom where there's a transition point between humiliation and exaltation is this highly disputed, often disputed point that is quite glorious, which is Christ's descent into Hades. And that's where we are in terms of if you're mapping out Christ's humiliation on this earth and ministry, right down at where the V comes back up is Christ's descent into Hades. And why it's right at the bottom is because this is a halfway point. This is a part Christ's humiliation and part Christ's exaltation point. And I'm going to explain in a moment why, but where we're at now is we are now on the way up in terms of studying Christ's exaltation and various chronological stages of his exaltation. And so follow with me, we're right at the bottom in this point of both half and half humiliation, exaltation with Christ's descent into Hades, into death, into Sheol, you could say. Uh, and uh, for this passage, or for this topic, I have 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 22. And if you want to think pretty closely on me uh, or with me on this one, you might want to turn there as well. This is 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. And uh, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now, we got to think about that. We're right there. Made alive in the spirit. And the verse goes on to say, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey God when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So did you catch that? It's kind of hard grammatically but in which, in the spirit, he went and proclaimed to them in prison, in darkness, in lower Sheol. Now, it comes back in verse 21 where it says baptism, new subject here. Baptism, which corresponds to this now, saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. 
Now, the main aspect of this text that I want us to begin to think about in this transition point of Christ's humiliation and exaltation is at the beginning. In Christ in the Spirit, going and proclaiming to those spirits in prison. Those very ones associated that were rebellious and opposed and hated of God um, during or prior to the universal worldwide flood that we know in Scripture. So this is an incredible point, incredible aspect, often missed in theological study for the humiliation and exaltation of Christ, which is during the three days that transpired between Christ's death and his resurrection, the spirit of Christ was actively involved in what, uh, what we, could be, we could summarize as his proclamation of victory in Sheol. Very interesting. Right? Christ's spirit was, was not just laying there in the grave with Jesus. It was active. It was somewhere. And it was in death, yes, in Hades, in Sheol, but there is victory there. He was declaring his accomplishment, the victory of his work upon the cross to spirits in prison. Now, this is really, really an incredible point because there's an aspect of humiliation in the sense that Christ's spirit has descended into Sheol in a manner of which it would not if he didn't die as a man. So he did go to death. He, he, he descended into the ground. He was, he was down there. He was dead in the terms of his spirit was there occupying that place because he died. And so we see that as an aspect of a stage in his humiliation. But he's there exalting the work of what he's done upon the cross and what he's doing and about to do in his resurrection. Christ's proclaiming to the spirits in prison in lower Sheol, this is satanic authorities. He's essentially rubbing his victory in their face. He is declaring to them that he has won the battle over them in his work upon the cross. The strong man, Satan, is now bound. Christ's death has sealed the victory blow that he is asserting over all the powers of hell and all the powers of Satan. He wanted to know, he wanted them to know that all their efforts, all their tasks, all that they'd done was in vain and would continue to be in vain. And I love what Samuel D. Renahan writes on this subject. He says it far more eloquently than I could when he says, the one whom they murdered was victorious, and they had no power whatsoever to hinder what was going to happen next. Jesus also caused everyone who died in unbelief to know that the one whose name they had refused to name, the one upon whom they refused to call, was precisely whom the scripture said he was, precisely who he said he was. They know that their condemnation is just. And I love what he says here. This was not preaching in the sense of an, an evangelistic opportunity for those who had died in unbelief, granted, but a proclamation of victory and vindication for Christ whom they had killed. Isn't that incredible? Glorious truth of Christ's exaltation, even in the grave, his spirit proclaiming, preaching his glorious victory over all the powers of hell, over Satan himself. So again, we're at the bottom, half humiliation, half exaltation as we now move in to the stages of Christ's exaltation with the last half an hour that we have for our class. Christ's exaltation. Now we're, Christ's ministry is no longer characterized by humiliation. His position is one of victory and one of glorious triumph, okay? So there's four stages we're going to be examining here, which are his resurrection, his ascension, and his session at the right hand of the Father, and then finally his physical return. So we're just going to biblically or look, uh, look at a few passages and examine those together. So the first stage of Christ's exaltation is probably the one that we will all know and, and nod our heads and understand probably more than the rest, which is Christ's resurrection, coming back from the grave. And remember, we're chronologically looking at this whole story. Spirit joined with body, Christ coming back from the grave in glorious reality and manifest glory arrayed. This is Acts 2, verse 29 through 31. And this will be Peter's preaching at Pentecost. He says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence 
about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Speaking of Jesus Christ, the king, coming back from Hades, coming back from death, not staying in Sheol, but coming up to life. And this is the greatest example of Christ's exaltation that we're certainly familiar with, which is his defeat of the grave, his defeat of death. Unlike those before him, and even unlike David, who penned those words in the Psalms, um, Christ came back not to experience death another time, but come back to resurrected glory and life. He would not be abandoned to Hades. His body would not experience corruption. He would not stay dead. Death would not have a victory over Jesus. He had experienced death. Yes, he endured death, but its reality was gone by him coming back. And the scripture tells us that Jesus Christ of his own power came back of his own volition, of his own glory, of his own dominance over death would come back from the grave. Now, it doesn't only, only say that, it actually says the Father was active in his resurrection as well. John, or sorry, not John, Romans 6, verse 4. We have other instances in Scripture that even speak of the Holy Spirit's work in Christ's resurrection. So we can even say, really, by summation, that the, whole, the resurrection is a Trinitarian act of God. But it is really interesting that unlike many of the men Christ, um, well, let's just say one in particular, Lazarus, coming back from the grave, Christ would not in essence be of the exact same variety in his resurrection. He did not, as I mentioned, come back to then one day look to death again. Christ came back not in the same manner as he was before. Christ had come back to live forever in his resurrection. Body and soul was restored to life in a glorified existence, but in a glorified existence that is a type and a first fruit of us believers that we will one day know in eternity with resurrected bodies. And I like uh, Louis Burkhoff again, I'm borrowing from him, he's got great language on this. He describes Christ's resurrected person in, uh, in, in terms like this, he says, incorruptible, incapable of decay, glorious, re uh, resplendent with heavenly brightness, powerful, that is instinct with energy and perhaps new faculties, spiritual, meaning adapted as a perfect instrument of the spirit. I mean, Christ in his resurrected glory was tangible and that he could be felt. He was visible and that he could see. I mean, he even ate with his, his disciples at that point in glorious array. But he was not the same. The veil, in a sense, was beginning to be pulled back as his glorious self was showing. And he could even, in a sense, uh, just by means of what the scripture tells us, transport, in a sense, around very quickly uh, with his disciples. <clears throat> this reality... Uh, that I like Burkhoff's explanation is what was gloriously evident in Christ's resurrected person. Now the resurrection, as we think about the exaltation stage of Jesus, is very important to understand because of its significance or what it communicates. The resurrection was God's declaration of the accomplishment of his people's justification. It was a, a statement to every Christian that God accepted the work of Jesus Christ at the cross and that every sin was now paid for and in Christ's resurrection it was done. The legal forensic statement of our righteousness in Jesus was complete. He absolved the sins of his people. Now it was just a matter of, of bringing that salvation to effect to his elect throughout every generation by the agent of the Holy Spirit. God had done a work and a resurrection communicates our legal justification. It is as done as Christ coming back from the grave. It is also the Father's declaration that the last enemy has been vanquished. And that last enemy being death. Death doesn't have the same sting for the believer. It's taken out. 
We will walk that dark veil one day. We will pass through. We will enter those dark waters. But for the Christian, and we all have different experiences, and Christians throughout history have had different experiences walking through death, but we know one thing, that the worst sting of death, the sin sting of death, is taken out for the Christian, and that eternity awaits them, Christ awaits them on the other side. We do not have the same experience of those outside of Jesus. The resurrection, again, declares that the last enemy has been vanquished. It also symbolizes what will take place in the life of every believer in the future resurrection to come. Christ is showing us that this is a type of what is the reality for us, him as first fruits, us as those to come later. We will experience and know a resurrected glory like Jesus because the spoils of his accomplishment are given to us, his people. So keep those in your mind as you think about the first stage of Christ's exaltation. Second stage of Christ's exaltation is his ascension into heaven, his actual leaving this earth in bodily glorified form and entering heavenly glory with the Father. And Luke 24, 50 to 51 says this, and he led them out as far as Bethany, Christ, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Um, it's been said that the ascension of Jesus Christ is the necessary complement and even completion of the resurrection. It is that aspect of culmination of, of the resurrection and what it communicates. That Christ is now in exaltation and it is time for him to leave and be seated at the right hand of the Father. It is not just a resurrection for a resurrection's sake. It is a resurrection for ultimate glorification in the place that he is suited as the eternal God. It manifests the outcome, the ultimate outcome, Christ's return to the glory with his Father. Christ's life of glory began in the resurrection. It was perfected, you could say, in the ascension to heaven. So it is a completion of the stage of exaltation there. Very simply, Burkhoff says that it is the visible ascent of the mediator from earth to heaven according to his human nature. Now, just an implied point on that is that this is tangible. This is a reality. Heaven is not just a condition or a place of mind. Heaven is a real, tangible location. Christ physically ascended, witnessed by his own disciples, into heaven. So much so that they were bewildered, continued to stare up there until the angel said, why do you keep looking up there, right? Why are you still looking? Christ has commanded you to do something. Go. It is a physical, glorious aspect of Christ manifest, manifest, uh, which is another word of saying public, shown, exaltation. And one other passage that complements this aspect of his exaltation is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 and 10. It says, speaking of this ascension, Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And verse 10, he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Make all things right and done. It makes me think of Revelation 5. Who is possible? Who is the one who can open this scroll with its seals? Of all people, everyone looking around, what is it? And the weeping of John coming from that very moment. The will of God cannot come about, it seems, until Christ. The lamb that had been slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah, enters in, takes the scroll. He is the one who can open it. Praise the name of the Lord. And this is the accomplishment that the ascension brings about. Bringing him to heavenly glory. Bringing with him a host of captives. Setting those free in Sheol unto heaven with Jesus Christ. Giving gifts to all of his people. And gifts certainly most typified, most um, described in the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, stage number three as we get closer and closer to the end of time here in Christ's exaltation is Christ's session at the right hand of the Father on high. Christ's session. And uh, session is just uh, uh, at the right hand of the Father is another way of saying his enthronement, his rule, his reign in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Acts chapter 2 verse 33 through 36 says... Being therefore exalted, and again, this is Peter's sermon at Pentecost, 
being exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. That's the Holy Spirit. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified, the King of kings, seated at the right hand of the Father, prophesied to be so in the Old Testament scriptures. Peter is not only recounting the resurrection of Jesus, but also the accumulation of this glorious exaltation of Jesus by his rightful reestablishment to power in heaven on high. This is the event that Jesus even spoke of himself in when before the high priest testifying of himself. There are other instances, but I find that one very unique, that he spoke of himself as such before those who were seeking to condemn him. Peter refers to Psalm 110 in describing this position Christ now occupies. And this position Christ now occupies in heaven, the right hand of God, is a picture of Christ's sovereign position over all granted to him in heaven. This is language of, uh, you might say, his public inauguration of heavenly authority as the God-man over all things. Now, it's not that before he was put in that position in heavenly array glory as the God-man that he wasn't king, but that this was now a manifest, public inauguration of his power before heavenly authorities. And the Bible declares that this rule constitutes Christ's receiving supreme government of the church, of heaven, and of the earth. You can might say everything, everything. Dominion, power, authority, glory, majesty, all to Jesus Christ at the right hand of the Father. John Calvin states that he, Jesus, was installed in the government of heaven and earth and formally admitted to possession of the administration committed to him and not only admitted for once, but to continue until he descend to judgment. And when we think of the, the terminology of this governmental sovereign rule of Jesus, his seated, or the fact that he is seated, I should say, at the right hand of the Father, is not a passive rest type of terminology. It's not as though Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father to, in a sense, rest from his works, not, not be active in terms of control, power, dominion, and glory. Absolutely not. This is more to communicate the fact that Christ's authority is sealed. His authority is complete. It is secure. It is uncontested. It is eternal. It will not be moved, right? He is seated on his throne. It belongs to him. It is his rightful glory. And he rules and reigns from his established position in heaven. And Christ is active in him sitting on that throne in ways such as protecting the church by his spirit, governing the church by elected leaders, exercising authority over nature, over even powers hostile. To his own bride, he exercises authority. He judges those who are enemies to him. He continues his prophetic work in the world through means of the Holy Spirit. And even his priestly work on that throne, making intercession, applying his sacrificial work, making it effective for his elect's justification and sanctification. Now that's a lot. But if I can communicate anything just clearly, it is that this session at the right hand communicates Jesus has all power, all authority over every realm and always will have it as the God-man, enthroned God-man. So the fourth and final aspect as we draw close uh, to the end of our class is this final stage in Christ's exaltation, his physical return, okay? His physical return. And I, I would really say that this is the highest point. This is the climax of Christ's manifest exaltation as he returns in a way that he manifests his glory such that not everyone else had experienced prior. This time, every eye will see his glory. 
every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to the enthroned King, Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 30 to 31. There's lots of text to choose from in terms of Christ's second coming, but this one's pretty generally descriptive. It says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So from this text, probably from many others too, we can assert that there is a day when the presence of Christ the King will be manifest to everyone uh, without partiality. Everyone will come to witness this coming of Jesus. It is a physical it is a visible return of Jesus. And one particular important aspect of why it's his exaltation is that it is a day of judgment. It is a day of judicial reckoning. It is even a day, we could call it, of the vengeance of the Most High, the Son of Man, where all will be judged. All truths, all hidden things will come to be made plain. This is one of the main purposes of his exaltation. There will be in Christ's second coming, a vindication for not only his own name primarily, but for his own people in the punishment of the wicked. And that is exactly why it says that all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Those who rejected Jesus Christ, those who turn their back on him will find this day of judgment a most dreadful and awful day for themselves. They will run, they will seek to hide, but they will not be able to. It is a day of judgment in exaltation of Christ. And that is one aspect that exalts Christ far more than, in a sense, many others in terms of what the scripture highlights, that he is exalted in his judgment. And secondly, it is a day of salvation. It is a day of manifest salvation for his people. This is a day of the most glorious day for his own elect. Christ will be, you could say, perfecting the salvation of his bride, making them completely pure in final resurrected glory. Not only uh, just uh, glorified spirits in heaven or even those who are still on earth in the time, but now united with glorified body once for all, worshiping Christ in a similar manner that he was glorified in. So this is the most final and, uh, and really in most many, in many ways, the most manifest public stage of Christ's exaltation as his work and his power and his ministry all culminate in this final day, this final stage. So those are the stages. Uh, generally speaking, there's different aspects, different little branches that we could have covered. We don't have time to do it, but that cover this, this progression of Christ's humiliation into exaltation. And in many ways, even just talking about these aspects of Jesus Christ is enough to make application to your heart. The Bible really is exhorting us all to just look at Jesus. And in the looking at Jesus, we see the greatest transformation taking effect in our lives. But there are two things I just wanna spend time as we close our class off today making application with and from the things that we've looked at here and uh, hopefully we'll find that they relate in, in what we see in Christ's humiliation and exaltation. Firstly, for us to think about from what we studied of Jesus this morning is to embrace suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ, to embrace it, um, not to bristle at it, but to actually embrace suffering and embrace, I could say, humiliation for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I really think, uh, especially when we think of the persecution aspect of this reality that the church today is, is, is losing this, is really losing this point, or is at least losing their grasp on, on the willing suffering of Jesus. And so this is a vital point for us to realize. First Peter chapter two, verse 20 to 23, probably one of the most important, one of my favorite verses on the subject says, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, for, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. 
For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was there deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Now, if anyone had the right to bristle at the, 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 the ill treatment of man in his experience, would, would it not be Jesus Christ the Lord? Right? Of all people that had walked this planet, would it not be the God-man? He who, it says, committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Perfect. Perfect. And yet suffered voluntarily. Suffered voluntarily because he knew a day of judgment would come. But suffered voluntarily also for the example of his chosen saints. For us. A pattern. An example. That we're called to follow. And we, we, we're not only called to follow, but we get the motive. That Jesus did it. Jesus did it, Christian. Jesus suffered voluntarily. Jesus almost gave himself up, in a sense, to that suffering. There was no fighting back. There was not bristling. There was not push. There was like a lamb led to the slaughter. There was a giving up. And I don't mean giving up in the sense of his ministry, but giving himself up unto. We are, as Christians, following the pattern of our Savior in this life. In every way, yes. In every aspect of his character, but particularly in his humiliation. We are following his pattern. If we were of the world, what would they do? They would accept us, right? They would bring us in. And now that's not to mean that at times we may be the aroma of life unto some. But chances are, based upon Jesus' own words about the narrow and the broad way, that most are going to find Christians the aroma of death in their life. Most are going to find them to be the exposure of righteous, the, the lack of righteousness that they have and the exposure of the vanity that they constantly live in day in, day out. So how do you think they will respond? If they did those things to Jesus and he's our master, what will they do to us? Jesus' own teaching. The Christian, or sorry, I should say, because we stand with Christ, the world hates us. The Christian is not one who, when experiencing opposition at the hands of enemies, immediately begins formulating how to fight back or make its own self-defense or even try to get out or escape. Rather, we are called to willingly endure suffering. Willingly endure. And I fear almost in a way that so much talk about self-defense and our own, uh, our own personal self-defense, it sometimes chips away just subtly chips away at the foundation of what Jesus Christ is actually calling us to do. Now, I'm not making an argument for no self-defense, brothers and sisters, but what I am saying is we need to be very careful that a lot of what is common in many of our streams today doesn't cut away at our own willingness to follow the pattern of our suffering Savior, Jesus Christ. Because after all, is it meant to be this ultimate sorrow? Is it meant to be this ultimate pain? I mean, you think about the martyrs of church history and, and, and the joy that they even had just with the reality that they were going to die in a similar manner to their Savior, Jesus Christ. Is it not the sweetest thing to be counted in the camp of Christ? Counted in the camp of Christ. Right? If you, if you know uh, Pilgrim's Progress chapter 2, and I've probably quoted this more times than I ought to, but... Pilgrim's Progress chapter 2 is they progress on the way and they find themselves in the valley of humiliation. And they find there are Christians, pilgrims, who have set up permanent camps there because that's where they meet with Jesus the most. They don't want to leave. They don't even want to go because it's there in the persecution, in the humiliation, that they find the closeness that they desire the most with Jesus. Right? The sweetest times to say, yes. For the sake of Christ, I am suffering. For the sake of Jesus. This is a call, brethren, to consider suffering for the sake of Christ a blessing. It is a wonderful thing to be counted with Jesus. It is a wonderful thing to suffer with Jesus. 
Every scar and every pang and every pain we experience at the hand of our enemies for the sake of Jesus Christ will return to us a reward, not only in heaven, but in this life, I would argue. A reward, a joyous thing. Humiliation is the path of our Savior. Humiliation precedes exaltation, just like it did with Jesus, and he's our pattern. So every time we see an opportunity or every time there is in our life a experience of humiliation for the sake of Jesus, it ought not to be our inclination. To say, how do I run? How do I fight back? How do I get out of this? Is to just take a moment to visualize Christ, to see him as our example and his work that he's done on our behalf. Consider it a blessing, sweetness. We can be comforted also, not only, that's sort of another note, uh, or this is sort of another note, but in Christ's rule and in his reign, we have comfort in our suffering, no matter what it is. As a church, individually, the fact that Christ is reigning and ruling on the throne, the exaltation we talked about, the final judgment, should tell us as Christians that we need not be insecure or, or out of sorts or undone by the experience of persecution or the hatred of man or anything that we experience in this world because Jesus is enthroned, is anything outside of his control, anything outside of his decree and dominion, absolutely not. He controls it and ought to give us comfort. The last point as we are uh, right on the end here is that we ought to fix our eyes on eternity. Fix them on eternity. There's something that really stands out, especially about all these states of Jesus Christ and exaltation, all the, the manifest glory that he has in heaven ascending to the Father on high. It is that there is glory to come. There is glory to come. And brothers and sisters, we experience, even as we gather on the Lord's day, just little drops from heaven of that glory, with it, with it, whether it's the word of God, right, learning about Christ, whether it's the fellowship of believers, it's the singing to Christ, it's the, the gathering for the Lord's table. These are meant to be these tiny, tiny pictures and illustrations of the beauty of what is coming. I can hardly imagine, and I'm sure you can't either. Sometimes you're just raptured in thought as to what it's going to be like to actually look upon the face of our Savior, to be ushered into his presence, to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, <laughs> us, Wicked servants, but through the work of Christ, ha, good servant. Imagine eternity after eternity, and we still haven't worn out the beauty of what it's like to worship Jesus with our sinless brethren in our midst. And so even in just looking at his exaltation, we get visible, and I think we need a refresher on what is to come. Death is not the thing that ought to be feared from us as Christians, right? It is an entrance into glory. It is a pathway to what Jesus has stored up for his people. Christ has secured a glorious end for his bride. He has gone to incomprehensible lengths for his chosen people. And now Christ is arrayed in such eternal glory that it's more than we could imagine. And all this is a reality that's promised to the believer in the work that Jesus has done. The inheritance of his work he gives to us in eternity. The same glorified state, resurrected glory we will enjoy forever. His presence will be our ultimate joy for eternity. And we will enjoy his worship for all of our days. And these are the Bible's constant motivation, Christian, for even suffering, for everything in this life. Is to look, 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 look. Fix your eyes on what is to come. Fix your eyes on eternity. Look to heaven where Christ is seated and find strength, find joy, find comfort, find security and perseverance. Isn't that what Revelation just reminds us of over and over and over and over again? It's look. Look at the story of Jesus Christ over and over and over again. Look where he is now and we are more than conquerors in him who conquered for us. And so stand strong. So this is a great motivation for the Christian in this life. We're looking to Christ, all that he has laid up for us. We're fixing our gaze on the glories to come in Christ. And we're asking ourselves, what possible suffering could ever supersede that promise? Right? And to use the example of Christian martyrs again, so many of them, so many of them, as they were on the cusp of their death or uh, even their torture, their execution, it was, it was their joy 
to know that it was just, just a matter of a short period of time before they would be with their beloved bridegroom, Christ. We must press on to keep eternity, brothers and sisters, and the Christ that awaits us in eternity before our eyes. This is where we will gain a great source of strength. This is where we will gain great comfort. And this is where we will begin to rid ourselves of the love of this world when we, by contrast, are seeing the beauties that Christ has laid up for us instead of the trinkets that are offered here, the small baubles that are offered. So Colossians 3, they we're ending on this verse, in verse 2 through 4 says this to us, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then also will appear with him. Then you also will appear with him in glory. He is our life. We're looking to the source of life. And if we think this is life, we can't even imagine the life with Christ, the, the one in whom we are hidden in currently. But that hiddenness will be revealed finally when he comes. A life more tangible, a life more real, a life true as it was meant to be in Jesus, restored through his blood and given graciously to all who come. And let me use that as a point of exhortation to you who may be among us and don't know Jesus. All that I'm talking about today, all that we're discussing in Scripture is open to everyone freely who comes by faith in Jesus' name. He stored up this for those who would find rest in himself. He went through these extreme elements of humiliation as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for those who are undeserved of his grace, all of us. Yet he promises this great exaltation in the work that he's accomplished. And so come, come, come to Jesus. Come to this Christ and experience what we're, what we're speaking of even this morning. Be so heavenly minded, brethren, that you are of great earthly goods. Be so heavenly minded that you have no time for the love of this world. Uh, what a beautiful reality. This is our current reality. We have died and our lives are hidden with Christ in God. So let's give thanks with this last uh, few moments uh, before we have a time of fellowship and our service will begin. Brothers and sisters, join me in prayer. God, you are so good. God, you are immeasurably good to us. Thank you for the greatest gift that we could ever receive, which is Jesus Christ the Lord, your incarnate word. You have not shown us who you are more clearly than you have in your holy son who came to this world. And God, it's so incomprehensible that the things he would suffer, he would voluntarily suffer for us. Oh, praise Jesus. Praise our Christ. Lord, we pray today that he would be lifted up, glorified, manifested, Lord, worshipped in this gathering. Bless us with a greater awareness of Jesus Christ that we may be, God, usable, um, purified vessels of our Savior. Oh, we thank you. We thank you for Christ the Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.